Hey friend, before we dive into today's podcast episode, I want to let you know that today doors are open to Elevate University, which is the number one online membership for new entrepreneurs like you to help you navigate the emotional and mental journey of building a business so you can learn to get out of your own way and achieve breakthrough results in your business without all the drama. It's like a gym membership, but instead of working out your biceps, you're working out your brain and you are cultivating a mind set with confidence and building and implementing the systems your business needs from the start. To learn more and take advantage of an early bird offer, you can head on over to shedidherway.com forward slash elevate. Again, it's shedidherway.com forward slash elevate, E-L-E-V-A-T-E. I can't wait to see you inside. This year's fourth annual She Did It Her Way Summit is taking place on October 24th, 2020, and early bird tickets are now on sale. This year's one-day virtual summit with a Friday evening kickoff is all about the journey from corporate cubicle to being your own boss and sharing that it doesn't have to be hard and overwhelming and complicated. We've sat down with hundreds of entrepreneurs to learn their journey and story all about how they started a business while working full-time, replaced their corporate income, and made their ultimate leap. This year's summit, we've simplified that process, and we are bringing you the most relevant and important trainings during this one-day event. So friend, if you are listening to this and you have that business idea, you maybe even don't even have that business idea, but you are on the cusp of knowing that you want to work for yourself and become your own boss and you are looking to 2021 to be your year, it is time. It is time to give yourself permission to take your very next best step and to sign up and attend this one day epic, epic event that is happening. And it's all virtual. You get access to all the replays. If you can't make the trainings the day of, or even some of the trainings as well, we've made it super, super accessible. And I'm telling you that this is life changing. This will change your life if you let it. And I want you to be there. And I want this to be the pivotal point in your 2020 that when you look back, you're like, I'm so glad I did that. So you can head on over to she did it her way summit.com to learn more and to get your early bird ticket today. Welcome to the She Did It Her Way podcast, where it's all about making the ultimate leap from your nine to five and building a business in life you love all while doing it your way. I'm your host, Amanda Boleyn. Let's get started. Hello, She Did It Her Way listeners. Welcome back to another episode of the She Did It Her Way podcast. I am so excited to bring you guys today's guest. That is the lovely Jasmine Starr. She is a photographer and business strategist from Newport Beach, California. She dropped out of law school and became an internationally recognized creative entrepreneur, later to become the founder of Social Curator, which I love, by the way, a social media marketing membership for business owners, Harnessing her chutzpah and hustle, Jasmine empowers entrepreneurs to build a brand, market it on social media, and create a life they love. Some days you'll find her featured in Forbes, Entrepreneur, and Inc. Magazine. Other days you'll find her going live on Instagram, hosting Ask Me Anything sessions on Facebook, and empowering business owners to build a life they love on her podcast, The Jasmine Star Show. Jasmine, welcome to She Did It Her Way. Thank you, Amanda. I'm so happy to be here. And thank you for that intro. It was just like slam, bam, ready to hit the ground. I love I'm, it. No, it was amazing. I mean, you're fantastic. So it, it was pretty easy to, to be able to do that. Well, so there's so many things that I want to unpack in your journey of becoming an entrepreneur. And so many of my listeners are in this space of either thinking they want to start a business or knowing what business they want to start, but having the courage to take that next step. Right. And so much of what we share on the show is about the leap. So what I would love to do is kind of like rewind time and go back to when you were in college, when you graduated, what that looked like, and then you went into law school, but dropped out. So take us back to Jasmine star in those days, and then we'll catch up to where you are today. Oh, okay. This is cool. This is really cool. I actually don't ever really get much taken back to college, which I think is like pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. I am daughter of an immigrant, first generation Latina to pursue college. And so for us, when I say us, I also have a twin sister. So you'll hear me like it's, I've only ever done everything with her through my adulthood. So when it was time for us to go to college, it was really important. Um, We didn't know how to fill out college applications. We didn't know how to get financial aid. Uh, We just knew that we had scholarships. And so the family had decided collectively that we would go to 
the college that gave us the most money, not thinking that my sister and I would both get the maximum amount of money That's from amazing. the same college. <laughs> yeah. You know, so we're like, oh, okay, I guess we're going to college together. Yeah. And uh, when I graduated, I graduated uh, summa cum laude, which means that you have straight A's. And I don't say that for any other reason other than the fact that I don't think I'm particularly smart and I don't think that I'm savvy. I don't even necessarily quantify myself as an intellect. I just know that I know how to work hard. Mm -hmm. And I just think that consistency above all else is the barometer in which you met, measure your future success. And I learned that quite honestly in college, there were so many people who had so much more advantages. They were much smarter, much, many more connections for all intents and purposes. They had the keys to the kingdom and it's the people who just consistently knock on the door that get the results. And as a result of uh, graduating summa cum laude, I earned a full ride scholarship to UCLA law school. And That's that was kind of pivotal in our family because we had never gone and pursued upper education. Well, my parents barely graduated high school. So this was like all yeah. uncharted territory for us. And I didn't know at the time, I didn't know at the time, but in retrospect, I could say I was choosing what I thought was the safe path because that's what a daughter of an immigrant does. Mm. Like, so for lack of as not aspiration, but like lack of desire or even permission, like as a kid, my biggest life aspirations, like I grew up in the hood. And so I only ever saw people doing blue collar work mm. and our neighbor was a nanny and there was this mom who would drive her Toyota Corolla, Corolla. And I thought like that Toyota Corolla is the fanciest car that like, has yes. ever, <laughs> that has ever graced our neighborhood. We're like, you have a Corolla? Like, wow. And she would get out and she'd be wearing heels and she would have, you know, a pleather briefcase. And I would look at her dropping her kids and I'm like, whatever she does, that's what I want to do. I didn't even know what it was. It was just like, you have a Corolla and you have heels, like, and you're not pushing a mop or a lawnmower, then dang, you're living the life. And so yeah. it's like to give yourself the permission to actually think that like business or something was in your future. I just didn't grow up that way. So I went to law school because even when I was, you know, 23, 24, I didn't give myself the permission to think that entrepreneurship or leadership or self-fulfilling desire was even a thing. And right. so in law school, it was not very happy, but I'm like, well, this is what you do. Like to get out of the hood, to change zip codes, to move your family from a certain socioeconomic status to another, this is what you do. And it was, you know, I wasn't happy. And when my mom had a relapse of brain cancer, everything came to a head because not only was I not happy, I saw fragility of life. And I was just like, I'm so wildly depressed, something has changed. So I, on a whim, walked into the Dean's office. I quit law school. I always thought I was going back. I thought I was going back. Yeah. I really did. But it was then that I realized, okay, my mom's life really forced me to reconcile. What, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. And that changed everything. Yeah. So talk to us. And I love, um, I wanted to unpack that because I think deciding there's so many people that I know that can relate to the story about being in, whether it's a corporate role or being a med student or law school, even college, right? Um, right? Thinking and just having that inner conversation of like, something's not right. This isn't necessarily aligned, but I'm taking in what everyone else is telling me I should do versus I just got chills, but like versus separating, what is it that I want to do? Because so often in early education, we're not conditioned to believe that you can create a life. It's very much go get knowledge, apply the knowledge, how good of a test taker you are and beyond that. And especially, um, coming with a background where you you've been raised in like that situation and, and seeing the lens that way, I had to imagine, I have to imagine that kind of making that decision to leave law school was really huge. And what you're saying is you thought you were going back. So what happened after law school and how did it transpire? Cause then we'll get into like building your business, which I want to unpack so much of that as well. Um, what was after law school and then. So after law school, so I had a full ride. This is like, this detail is really important because people have to understand like it was a massive shift because I had a full ride scholarship and the full ride scholarship to UCLA law included on campus housing. If you are mm. no longer a student, which I no longer was, I wasn't eligible to live on campus, which kind of threw at my whole life plan. You know, it's like I quit in a day and they're like, okay, you have to be out in a week. And I was like, wait, I don't have anywhere to live. I have no money. And so you do what any brown girl does. You move back home with your family. So my boyfriend at the time, 
he had, oh my Lord, this car, oh, Amanda, it was like, bless his heart. Like I must've really loved this guy. Cause this is like a beater of a car. It was like a 1983 Ford Ranger. It was a white oh truck, gosh. but it had a white cab on it and this orange carpet in the back. Like, come oh on now. You know, it was like, it that was is, a winner. It was which is winner crazy of a car. to think that they put orange carpet in cars. I mean, right, who knows? Right. Maybe they're going to put purple carpet. I don't know. Who knows? It, is, it was like in a truck bed. I was like, why is there carpet in the back of a truck bed? But it's neither here nor there. Yeah. I, will, I, can, I can clown on that car as much as I want, but that car was the thing that moved me out in 48 hours from my wow. studio apartment. So we packed up, we packed up his truck. I moved back home and it kind of forced me to reconcile what is it that I want to happen. And at the time the doctors had said her time had come and I had been dating my high school sweetheart, JD, uh, by this time, like almost nine years. And so, or actually nine years. And we had planned a wedding in less than three months. And I was just like, just our families. Like I want oh. her to see us get married. And so she, and the doctor said she wouldn't talk and she wouldn't walk and she wouldn't be able to travel. And my mother, who is just like a pillar of strength, did all of those things. She walked down the aisle. She was bald. My dad was on my other arm. Best oh. day of my life. And I feel like it wasn't the marriage and it wasn't the wedding. It was us watching a miracle because years later, what we thought was the end of her life was actually just a new chapter because she's still here with us today. Oh, we beat all the odds. It's absolutely incredible, but we didn't know that at the time. And so I got married when I was 25 and my mom was 50 and it forced me to actually decide like, if I knew that law school wasn't my path and I knew I didn't even want to be a lawyer, what was I doing there? Mm. And it really slaps you across the face. We're like, life is short. Like, what are you doing when you know that's the thing you don't want to do? Right. And so uh, we, so my husband and I moved into an apartment. We were living in this totally ripe neighborhood of Los Angeles. It was like not the place you walk your dog at night. And so we're there. He's with a startup company. I am a law school dropout. I'm working part time at my dad's church just because I'm like, I need something. I need mm. some sort of money. And um, I get a letter to go back to law school. JD is sitting across the table for me and I'll never forget we're eating like a Mediterranean penne pasta and it, it comes on a pink sheet of paper. It says UCLA, you have to come back to get back into your spring semester. And I'm looking at him and I'm crying and I'm like, I don't want to go back. And he says, well, if you could do one thing for the rest of your life, what would it be? And I said, I want to become a photographer. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, okay, you don't have a camera. And I was like, I know, but like in my heart, I think my heart, I, I think I could do this. And so mm -hmm. December, 2005, I unbox a very simple camera and that changed my life because I just practiced. I, like, I read everything on Google. I would watch tutorials. I would take any free job. I would intern. I was literally working three days a week at my dad's church, two days a week, interning, sweeping floors, organizing mm -hmm. files for any photographer, just to like get in the game. 2000, Seven, I had my first client. And by 2009, um, the business was voted one of the top photographers in the world. And I think that that's a, that's a testament to having nothing, mm -hmm. teaching yourself to the democratization of education on the internet and the ability to build a brand. And a brand is just making people think or feel a certain way about you and your business. That learning mm -hmm. when you're at the bottom and you just take any free resources that you can and it can catapult you into a million dollar business. That right there is what I preach. That is what I believe. I have done it in multiple iterations of my businesses. And that's what I'm so emblazed to teach people like y'all. Yeah. The world is your oyster. Yeah. And I mean, not to mention, I think the, the, another big piece too, is the patience to have like knowing that where you are, isn't necessarily where you want to be. And yet taking the steps and being patient to let that unveil. Cause I think sometimes in the world that we live today, it's really easy to look at someone who has invested over 10 years from when they started to where they are now and look at the highlight reel, not realizing that, wait a second, this didn't happen in a three-year span. This didn't happen in a five-year span. This happened in over a decade and having the persistence and patience to say, I got the camera in 20, in 2005. I got my first client in 2007. And then you became a world renowned photographer in 2009. Like it's just incredible. And like the and patience Amanda, with that. There's actually something that you just pointed out right now that I want to like put a pin in and like make sure we really hone into one thing because me feeling like I wasn't where I wanted to be was not relegated between 2005 and 2007. Hmm. Where I have not, where I have not been where I want to be has been relegated from 2005 to 2025. Yeah. Like 
Do you understand like how entrepreneurs are hardwired is that there's, and, and this is a thing that I falsely believed that there was this arriving, yes. that there was like this homecoming as if we're yeah. all Beyonce's in like this music video, right? Like there's this homecoming to like, I have arrived. I have everything I want. And it's like, no. And so until you can actually understand that not being where you want to be is the norm and not mm-hmm. be- being where you want to be is like, Hey boo, this is forever. As long as you have a business until you accept that you're always going to feel down when you say, Oh, just another day of not being where I want to be. Let me go out and hustle again. Totally has a transformative effect. Yeah, no. Yeah. Thank you for putting that pin in there because that is what I find often. And I went through this too. And sometimes I'll catch myself is that we sometimes think that being over there, that over there is better. Mm. And it's the truth is, is that over there isn't better because you're still going to have problems. You're still going to have challenges. They just change. And so I love that you said that once we accept that this is the norm, it's almost like we can let go of trying to rush getting to some place because it doesn't mean, because that, that other place doesn't necessarily mean that it's better. So yeah, I love that. Okay. So you've got your camera named top photographer in 2009. It's 2020. Um, tell us about the iteration of being a photographer to now having this massive online monthly membership, social curator, which is amazing, by the way, I'm a member and I was blown away. I'm like, wait a second. You are giving all of this for this. I'm like, (laughs) this is a no brainer, but I know that you've, you've had iterations, you've had people leave your team. So I would love to spend time kind of packing that, uh, unpacking that as well, because Mm -hmm. the online business space, I think until you really tap into it. It becomes this whole other world that people open up to that. They're like, Oh, I didn't know this existed this entire time. I mean, that's how I at least felt back in 2012. Um, and never really got into it in 20 until like 2015 myself. So yeah, I would love for you to tell us your journey and experience with building that. So before I actually talk about the journey, I always think about podcasting, like the person who's listening on the treadmill, walking their dog, feeding the baby breakfast or making dinner and everything on the in between. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that the conversation is never about me or my journey. It's about what you are going to get as a result of listening. So before I actually get into like the articulation or a story, let me just start with the end first. The end first is always, you do not have a business as much as you have a content media company, period. Mm. Is that that your success is directly related to the amount and efficacy of what you are putting out online, Mm -hmm. period, the end. So if people hear that and they're bristled and they're like, or bristled, bristled, whatever the word is, and they're kind of like, their hides are chapped and they're like, wait, what? Yes. So let me just quickly talk about different variations. I had no money. I had no formal creative or business education. I had no resources. I had nothing. And so what I decided to do was take whatever free resources were at the time. Now, remember, 2006, 2007, this is like the beginning of blogging. And I was like, I can get a blog and not have to pay for a website. I just get to talk about my learnings and talk about what I'm doing. And then slowly over time, the blog was getting somewhere in the ballpark of like 20,000, 25,000 unique views per day. Wow. And so I started understanding that when you put stuff out that becomes searchable and shareable, your business and brand grows as a result. And then all of a sudden the introduction of each iteration of social media, starting with Twitter. And I'm like, who cares about I'm eating pizza for lunch. <laughs> People did care and social conversations happened from learning social conversations happen in a scalable way. You go over to Facebook, same social conversations, except you having the iterations of photos and videos added Mm. and it was kind of wonky. And then Instagram comes around and everything is visually direct. Okay. What I learned from Twitter and Facebook, applying it to Instagram. And then the other iterations, YouTube, Pinterest, TikTok, all of those were iterations of what creating media to get people to talk about what your business does as a result of sharing content from blog to social media to videos, I started seeing a direct pressure point. So your content will lead to your products or services. And the more content you put out, the more on point your offering is going to be. I do not want to have like this misnomer that "Mm, you see, I'm a savant. I'm the uh, Aristotle of the business world. I can see what's happening. No, people will tell you exactly what is so hard in their life and their business. And then you are in a position to create something that fills that need. So as we're creating content, as we're putting out videos, as I'm teaching people everything I know about building their business in, on, in and online, mm-hmm. what would happen would people say, I have three main pressure points. Number one, I don't have any photos to share. Mm-hmm. Number two, I don't know what to say. You know, my life isn't Instagrammable. I'm not a copywriter. I'm not witty. Like, uh, I have 
writer's block. And number three, social media changes so much. I'm tired of always feeling like I'm behind and I don't have time to know what the next thing is. And so in 2017, myself and my business partner, who is my high school sweetheart, married out of my league, still don't know why this guy, still don't know why this guy gave me a ring. I'm totally baffled, but I'm here for it. Uh, We decided to see if we would be able to create a resource that combated the three things we heard again and again and again. The first inception of Social Curator in 2017, if you happen to be a member, like anybody listening, if you happen to be a member- (laughs) Of social security in 2017, bless your dang heart. It was like a good try. Like it was just being like, is this thing gonna work? Now here's the thing: we had this idea, we threw it together. The back end programming was like a hot mess, but we're like, I don't know if it's gonna work. We launch it July 2017, and we close we we closed our enrollment with 2,000. 444 members. So what did that say? Like, geez, that's amazing. But here's the thing. I am not special. I am not unique. I am not gifted. I just created something Mm. that people said they wanted. Oh, well, there you go. Business at its Mm. finest. Mm -hmm. And we learned a lot of lessons, made a ton of mistakes. And, you know, now here in 2020, we have thousands of members. It's continued to grow and it's completely changed. And let me tell you, Amanda, just to like loop back. Yes. Not where I want to be. Social curator is not where I want social curator to be. It's I would only never have better. guessed. Oh <laughs> girl. Oh, just wait, prepare your heart because in 2021, we're, we're going to blow your dang mind with oh stuff that we have. Yeah, I'm so excited. I'm really, it took us a while to get here, but finally, finally we're in the space and the place to invest heavily on taking it from a membership to a full on like platform. Like my dream is social curator becomes a digital marketing agency carried in your pocket. That's a big vision. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. That is like, that is amazing to to hear that. And especially you being so open and candid about, you know what, we launched in 2017 and it wasn't the best thing that we like put out there and we <laughs> learned a lot. And cause I think, again, it's all about peeling back that curtain and, and demonstrating that because it's so easy to get caught up in our thoughts to think that, oh, they, it's all figured out. Oh, they've never had a customer complain. They've never had someone not, you know, use or benefit or what, you know, whatever it is. And sometimes I think that fear that the stories that we tell ourselves creates the fear of even getting messy and scrappy because we think that if it's not perfect the first time, mm-hmm. then why would we even get started? <laughs> you, just, you, guys, you guys can't even, oh. if you're listening, you can't I see did. Jasmine, but she just leaned back in her chair and she's like, wait a second. Let, I just know I what's know, coming. I totally got all Puerto Rican because I'm wearing maybe big silver hoops. I peeled my hair back mm-hmm. and I was like, listen to me one minute. Okay. Nothing <laughs> like perfection is but subjective. Like, yeah. Right. It's subjective. It doesn't exist. So you can keep on waiting and waiting, waiting to make it quote unquote perfect. And you can show it to 10 people and two of them will think it's great. Mm-hmm. One of them will think it's terrible. And five of them will be ambivalent. Why? Because perfection doesn't exist. Your version of perfection is either too much or too little for some people. It is better. Your business will grow faster and stronger and get it to where you want to be when you mm-hmm. put it out, when it's about 75%. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Put it out, put it out. Let the audience fix it. hundred percent. They'll, they'll, like you said before, you know, they, they will tell you what they want. And we, and I find this too, is say, I don't know what to share. I don't know what freebie to create. And I always tell my students, I go, go back to your audience, go ask them, ask them what they want from you to create because they will tell you. And even if, and let's go back to the person who's just like, I ask, I ask on stories and I ask and nobody, nobody tells me what they want. Well, Mm. they don't, uh, my guess. And I'm just going to deal it to you straight because we've empowered over 21,000 entrepreneurs. And this is what I see again and again is the reason they're not talking back to you is because you haven't put enough content out to contextualize what they want from you. Oh, okay. Say that again. Let's put a pin in it and let's expand that. So, or putting a pin and then expanding doesn't make sense. Let's expand. (laughs) And then (laughs) I got you though. I got you. I got you. I got you. you. Um, You know, what we want is our audience to show us the way. And -hmm. what you first need to do is show the way and have the audience answer the question or ask questions that will then create the separate offering that will create the extra education. So, you know, 
you're going through social media and somebody's asking, what do you want to see from me? And they're a jewelry designer. You're like, Mm -hmm. uh, jewelry? Like you Mm -hmm. don't know. Now, when there's a jewelry artist who has a clear point of view, I take vintage jewelry and I remake them into new family heirlooms. I can engrave them. What do you want to know from me? Do you do oval cuts? Do you do brilliant? When people can Mm -hmm. contextualize what you give them first, they can then ask questions. But you're asking people to create your content. You're already 10 feet behind. Create the content, your fault, your audience will, will follow up with questions and or desires. The more content you create, the more feedback you get. It, mm-hmm. People just won't trust the process. And I'm like, do it, do it, do it. And you're going to do it for a year and it's going to suck. And you're not going to have any results. And people quit after four weeks. Mm. And it's just it. I mean, it's like your dedication as an entrepreneur, it's 12 months of sucking and not getting the results is going to lead you everything you need the next iteration, you're hitting the ground running. And it's just, it's just the long game. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes back to the, the perfect places. It won. It doesn't exist over there is not better. And it is, it's, it's such a long game. And then we have to be able to have the patience, the discipline, the persistence to say like, I'm in it and I'm not going to change my direction based on an outcome or a failed launch. Even if it happens over and over for the first year, like getting to that place and that mindset that I I love that. What is something looking back in your business that you, well, let me actually back up. So social curator, was that your first digital offering or did you have one before that? I had two digital offerings before that. So this goes, this goes back to what we're talking about. Yeah. I would like piece together. So when you were a photographer, you got that award in 2009, what did 2009 to 2017 look like in between photography and then a social curator. Cause I think so, that's, yeah, I'm excited to yeah. hear. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, in 2009, 2010, 11, 12, I started getting like really big awards. And these were things that were coming from third parties, even like Huffington Post had said, um, top 10 most socially influential photographers. So what this is doing is it started expanding my reach beyond just photographers. Mm. People were saying, here's a girl with, for no intents and purposes is built a business without any money. And built a seven figure business without any money and without the tools to do that. People are like, well, if it works in that creative industry, would it work in my creative industry? So it started opening up doors. And then I started using Instagram around 2011 Mm -hmm. and very much like a ton of people. I just use Instagram to be like, we, I can post photos (laughs) on the internet. And so for three years, I literally just wasted my life on Instagram, just like posting iPhone photos. And at the time, the sentiment was it should be exclusive mobile photos. At least, Mm -hmm. no, that was literally the conversation is even amongst professional photographers. Oh no, no, no. You don't use Instagram as a portfolio. It's only, I will never forget a Wild. I know in 2012 that said every time it was a unicorn. So every time a photographer posts a professional photo on Instagram, a unicorn dies and a bunch of photographers were like, yeah, this is so true. Okay. And I succumbed to it. I was like, you're right. This is just like my free experimental zone. And then in 2014, I started seeing a big shift and a lot of photographers using it as a portfolio. And I was like, I'm really tired of seeing me just waste time. And so I floundered another year of experimentation, 2015, 2016. I was like, okay, no, it was like 2015. I was like, no, I'm done wasting time on a platform that isn't moving the needle in my business and my life. Mm-hmm. And so I built out an Instagram strategy. I was like, stop where you are, figure out what it's working, why it's working and what people want. Spent a year doing that, saw massive growth, like over a hundred thousand followers in a year. And I'm like, oh dang, wow. this actually works. And I saw big, big, big growth in 2016. And at the end of 2016, after a bunch of people were like, what do you do on Instagram? What do you do on Instagram? What do you do on Instagram? I was like, huh. I can create a course on how to use Instagram for business, not how to use Instagram. So I kind of niched, niched it down. And that was the first digital offering of my business. And Amanda, it blew our dang mind, like mind. I was like the digital world. It was new for me. I had never heard of, I'd never run an ad before. I had never heard of cost per lead or earning per lead. I'd never heard the word webinar. I had never heard the word mastermind. I had never heard a follow-up sequence, nothing, nothing. I had nothing. And then all of a sudden this launch happened and I was like, oh my God, there's such a thing as money. And then there's a thing as internet money and, (laughs) and internet and internet money changes Like it literally changes like your family, Mm. your family tree. Like my family tree has completely changed as a result of what happened on the internet. 
That is, that is amazing and incredible. How did you decide? So when you started that, how did you choose your coach or who to follow, who to learn from? How did, what was that process like? The internet. I had never paid. So prior to goodness, prior to 2016, prior to 2016. So never had I paid for any sort of mentorship, coaching or anything. It was like all Google. And I remember I stumbled across, I didn't even know what an online class was. 2016, no idea. Stumble across this online class of this random guy who I have no idea about. And he's talking about this word called a mastermind. And I'm making dinner with my husband in the kitchen and we're watching. And he talks about how you up-level your businesses by making yourself accountable to a coach and a small group of people. And I was like, totally agree. And he's talking like, I really like this guy. I think he's so smart. And my husband, as we put the plate, so we'd been cooking and prepping for about 30 minutes. And then we sit and for the remainder 30 minutes, we're eating dinner, listening to this guy's presentation. And my husband says, I think this is expensive. And I was like, oh, totally me too. I was like, how much do you think? And he's just like, well, he's like, I think it's like $8,000. And I was like, no, I was like, nobody in the internet is going to charge $8,000. Like, I think it's like four or five Oh my gosh, Get to the end. And he's just like, you can join this mastermind for $25,000. And my exact reaction, I kid you not, was like, get behind me, Satan. And I closed my laptop. I was like, this guy's a freaking fool. He thinks I'm going to pay 25,000. This guy's freaking a joke. Okay. I was like, that's stupid. The internet's so crazy. Who would ever pay 25,000? So we are washing dishes together and we're kind of like quiet. And 30 minutes later, I sit on the couch and my husband's like, you're going to apply, aren't you? And I was like, no, 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 but wait, wait, wait. So the way that the application works is that you pay a thousand dollars to apply. Cause you have to show that you're serious and you pay a thousand dollars to apply. And if you're not selected, you'll get your thousand dollars refunded. Okay. Mm. So I was like, I'm just going to pay the thousand dollars and I know I'm going to get denied and I'll get my thousand dollars back. And JD's like, you're not going to get denied and you know, you're not going to get denied. So don't pretend. And I was like, <laughs> silly you, you have no idea. So I whip out my credit card the next day. Cause he says, I just think you need to sleep on it. I slept on it, mm-hmm. brought out my credit card the next day, paid the thousand dollars, fill out the application. Four days later, I got a call from the guy's team and says, we want to schedule an hour interview. I am extended a seat in a 20 person mastermind and I commit to paying $25,000. And it was in that, that the, the way that I had selected whether or not the business was ready, not me, Jasmine Starr mm. will never be ready to invest. I grew up very poor on government assistance mm. with people dropping off groceries on her porch. Jasmine will never be able to invest in herself because she has struggles with this ideology of like worthiness and like the value of a dollar. The business that is Jasmine Star, mm. could the business justify that? I, I told my husband, I said, if I could just make an additional $25,000 in the year and I break even, well, that's amazing. And yeah. I was like, I think that doing this, I can make $25,000. My husband agreed. He's like, I do think you could. And uh, the very first launch, and I don't openly talk about this very much, if at all, maybe I've mentioned it here and there, but we're friends. So let's just yeah. talk. We're, 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 yes, we're friends. We're, yes. <laughs> you know, we're podcast friends. Now. Yeah. Basically, I'm going to, I'm going to send like a French braid your hair and send you a bracelet. Yeah. And now um, post COVID, we're going to hang out and be BFF. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I'm here for it. Yes. Uh, so I invested the 25,000 and the first launch that we did of the course, we did $255,000. <gasps> yeah. Yeah. Oh, so that was, I, and and here's like, the thing, we did it, we did it wrong. You know, and, and here's the thing, Amanda, the product that we offered was $197. So we did volume. Wild. We just did volume. And um, again, Amanda, this goes back to the beginning part of the conversation is when you create a content company, right? Everybody. I don't care if you're a dog walker. I don't care if you're a social media strategist. I don't care if you're a graphic designer. I don't care if you're a baker. You have to create content that people will ask questions about. And when Mm. they ask questions, they're actually uh, revealing their pressure points. And when you create a solution for a pressure point and people were saying, I saw what you did with nothing on a free platform. Can you teach me? And that's what we just stepped into. We did it so simply. We did it quote unquote wrong. And that was the first stepping stone to making it better and making that offering. And we let that offering run for about two years and we launched it consistently. It was, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And And that led us to the second offering, which was, so people are like, okay, I got on Instagram, but I want to know how to build a brand. So Mm -hmm. I built a brand course and that was a high ticket item. We sold that 
for just over a thousand dollars. And that was the biggest launch we'd ever done in our business, which was massive. So things were happening. I'm like, Oh my God, I feel like I'm drinking from a fire hydrant. Um, and then I just realized that it was taking such an emotional and stressful toll launching courses formally. I know it doesn't have to be, but like that version of me, I was too closely held to results. And I didn't feel like all that pressure around a launch was good for Mm -hmm. me. And I kept on having to update a course. And I was just like, I just feel like I want constant connection with the people I'm serving. And with the course, it was siloed to six or eight weeks. And after that, it'd be like, okay, cool. Peace out. Go and be on your own. And I was like, I need something with consistency. And then what did we do? Based on what we learned from our members of Insta 180, our Instagram course in Path to Profitability, our branding and social media course, those were the three pressure points that we heard from our audience. And they said, Jasmine, you teach us how to use social media, but I don't have photos. Jasmine, you teach us how to build a brand, but I don't know how to write my own captions. Jasmine, you teach us about social media, but the last time you taught this, it's changed in the last six months. What do I do? Mm. That was the inception of Social Curator. Yeah. And and, I mean, in Social Curator, you legitimately, and you just hand over the template. And so anyone who's in there, you don't, I mean, you literally, it's a a copy and paste, and then you insert what it is that you want to say. It's ingenious and you have trainings every single month and all that. That's like in amazing. So then with the two other courses, did you sunset them and just kind of, we did, we did, yeah. we did, we did. And you know, sometimes it's a little bittersweet, but the thing that you hold on to, so our brains, like from like caveman origin, our brains have been programmed for safety. Mm -hmm. And safety is often a byproduct of recurring patterns. And so you hang on to the things that you think are safe, but on the subconscious level, those are also the things that are holding you back. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you really want to jump, but if you keep on hanging to the cliff, you're never going to know if you can make it to the other side. And I felt like on a subconscious level, we turned those courses on evergreen and was bringing in residual income. And I think the safe part of me would rather it die a slow death, but I also knew that the brand had to stay intact. And so if I was selling an Instagram course that didn't address the new features or algorithm changes or updated Mm. copy, I was going to affect the brand long-term. And I said, if this is not a direct, distinct brand building component, it, it has to, it has to stop. And we made that decision two years ago and we went full force into social curator. And I think a lot of people thought that was crazy and maybe it was, and maybe it is, but I stand by it. And I don't think we would have been able to grow social curator to what it is today. Had we still tried, um, breaking our attention to another online course. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's so good. And you have, I think I read, you shared it like almost over, over 20,000 members or in social No, that's going to be our goal. That's going to be that's our your goal. goal. That's our goal um, for the end of 2021 to have 20, but what we have served is over 21,000. So we have had people come in and this is another thing, like, just like, just the, the underbelly of having a subscription-based business specifically if there were people who came into social curator in 2017 and 2018 that are no longer members and I wish them well, Mm -hmm. I say I, I have, there was a point where I felt like. I don't know, as a business owner, you feel like the things that you put out, it feels like a piece of you. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, Amanda, it's crazy because I felt like that was something that was a little bit holding me back because I'm like, I wasn't looking at it as how to get better. I was like, oh, they're leaving. Mm. And I had a big, big, big foundational shift in saying, thank you. Thank you for leaving because you're forcing the business to get better. Mm -hmm. thank you for leaving because if you didn't leave, I would think that everything we're doing was good and okay. And as a result of that, we're now focused on, you know, over 10,000 members right now taking it. We want to double in 2021 and we want to be at 30,000 members by 2023. This is big, crazy, lofty goals. You know, (laughs) you know, this is what we're just going for. And this is like our dream aspiration. So yeah, this is us in the middle of it. Like that That little mire. That's where we are. I love it. I love it. And I also want to call out and appreciate that you had said, you know, you separated you from your business in terms of making a financial decision. And I think that's such a great exercise in any sort of situation, financial or a big decision to make is separating yourself and saying, okay, but what would this person do and trying on a different thought versus acting out of from a place? Cause sometimes as humans, as us personally, it's challenging to make some of the decisions that we need to make. But if we put a different 
hat on or I know um, the what would Jesus do bracelets. I mean, those there's something to it to say, what would Tony Robbins do? I don't know. What would Jasmine <laughs> Starr do in this instant? And you try on other people's thoughts. And in this case, you're saying, what would the business do? Not would mm-hmm. not what would me as Jasmine Starr do? So um, I want to be mindful of time too. This has just been amazing. I can't believe it's, it's flown by, but I would love for you to share what, um, where have you grown like where have you grown the most in your business internally, like inside transformation inside, not necessarily like externally, but like, well, I guess it does come out externally, but where have, where have you grown the most as a business had to really step it up? Um, You know, for me, it's wildly important. I wish I had learned this much earlier in my career and I wish I had learned it when I had pivoted in multiple times. Um, And that is to remind myself and to remind anybody who's listening, one of the thoughts that is so important to repeat again and again is that you are enough. That it's so Mm -hmm. tempting to always measure yourself against this like invisible watermark right? It's like, you know where you want to be and you might not have as many followers, as many, as much money. You might have the zip code or the red bottom shoes or the fancy purses. You might not be on vacation. You might be like your biggest dream is like in, you know, 14 months is to get on that Disney family cruise. Like maybe that's what it is. And you don't feel like in comparison Mm. to other people that that is enough. And when you remind yourself that things don't matter, as much as fulfillment and standing in your purpose does. And when you say, I am doing the best I can with what I have and I am enough in this moment, it's not until you fully embrace that, that you Mm -hmm. can actually move forward and achieve because you release yourself from the shackles of being held back by unmet expectations when you pull those expectations out of thin air. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so good. And so important, I think for all of us to remind ourselves and it goes back to what you're saying as the, um, the perfect. And we, sometimes if we define our success based on what other people define as their success, and ultimately none of that matters if we don't actually know what we define success is and we're aligned with it because otherwise we're just operating out of integrity. I love that. Well, let's move into a little fight, like rapid fire round. Um, so quick and fast, just whatever comes to mind. What is a non-negotiable for you in your life? Evening dinner with my husband and baby. Yeah. Which is so cute, by the way. Um, (laughs) What is one thing that you get the most inspiration from? Independent movies, like foreign independent movies. Oh, I like that. I've never had that response before. I like it. What is a quote or a mantra that you live by daily? Jump and the net will appear. What is the best $100 or less purchase one can make in their business? Ooh, a good facial cream. <laughs> like as an, as an entrepreneur, you get like those, you get those wrinkles and you get those dark circles. Yes. Buy yourself a good facial cream. You're going to need it. You're going to be on camera people. And then <laughs> what is, what's a favorite book of yours? It could be fiction. It could be nonfiction. Um, okay. So fiction, it would be the book thief by Marcus Zizek. It is actually like, um, a young adult book, but like transformative. I just loved it. The writing was beautiful. It like made me cry. And then like a business book, which is a little unexpected would be do the work by Stephen Pressfield. It's very short, it's very short, but it's just like a big swift kick in the pants. It's like, just do the work, yeah. do the work and the, and your business grows. I love it. Yes. That is a great book. Um, this has been amazing. Jasmine, thank you so much. You. Where can my listeners connect with you, learn more about you and social curator? You can find us at socialcurator.com in all social platforms at Jasmine Star. Yay. Thank you. Thank this, you. Yay. If you enjoyed today's podcast episode, you can head on over to she did it her way podcast.com where you can access the entire vault of she did it her way podcast episodes and more information all about how to make the ultimate leap from your nine to five. And if you enjoyed today's episode, I would be so grateful if you had it on over to iTunes and left a review, letting me know what you love about the She Did It Her Way podcast. Until next time, keep doing it your way.